lights on and unlock the door. <laughs> Email these changes to Senator Prescott and Representative Bates last night. Uh, and they're, I think, they're relatively minor, but uh, they, uh, we go a long way in helping make this a little bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, the first suggested change would be on page 2, line 16, where it talks about verification mailings. Uh, to make that language consistent with what was placed in Senate Bill 318. And I passed a copy of that around as well. Um, because this, uh, this, this uh, legislation would apply to local elections as well, uh, we don't necessarily know when all local elections are being held, for example, school district meetings or village district meetings where voters are actually registered. And uh, from an efficiency standpoint, uh, it would make sense to just do a single report for a generated mailing. After all, the town elections are over in the spring. Do the same thing in the fall uh, when the city elections are held. And then uh, for the state elections, uh, since we're requiring 60 days after the election, the primary, that date would fall pretty much on the general election day. Simply do a mailing for both elections 60 days within 60 days after the, uh, the general election. And we would ask that, that same provision apply on page 7, line 1, uh, which is also a section that deals with verification mailings. Uh, then the next thing, uh, and this was not in the, in the letter that I sent out, but I added it after a conversation with Representative Bates last night, and that was uh, changing the threshold of the money that we uh, have to keep in the election fund, considering that we are going to be spending money from that fund to accommodate the expenses uh, in this bill, uh, to change that from 15 times the amount spent in any given year to 12 times. And that will give us the flexibility that we need to implement, implement the, uh, the provisions of this bill. And those, those sections that are affected are page 3, line 35, and page 8, line 23. And then on page 5, line 29, the concern that, that I have here, and I think the clerks share this, is that the, the ballot clerks are, with this language, are given the authority to determine whether the voter actually qualify to vote or not. And, and we believe that, I certainly believe that, that there ought to be a higher authority that can resolve any appeals or disputes over whether a person is qualified uh, to vote or not. And in my opinion, that should be the moderator 
I know the clerks have a, have a suggestion that um, a voter that has a, an issue with the gum side be sent back to the registration table to resolve it with the supervisors of the checklist. And that makes perfect sense to me as well. In fact, that might be, that might be a better alternative than you know, just uh, the language that I propose here. Mm -hmm. Say that again? So you're pr proposing that the moderator? Well, what my proposal would be just add a sentence on line 29 that says disputes over qualifications shall, shall be resolved by the moderator. Um, and I think that addresses my immediate concern here. But I know the clerks are going to offer a suggestion that if there's a dispute or, or some issue over a voter's domicile at the check-in table, that they be sent back to the supervisors at the checklist uh, to resolve that issue. That gets them out of the line for people getting ballots, so you know, it wouldn't uh, bog that process down. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I think the clerks have a proposal to write them. And then the last thing I had was on page 7, line 26 and 29, through 29. Uh, there's language in here that would, would uh, allow us to skip the process of governor and council uh, on purchasing equipment, uh, waive the competitive bid process, uh, and then go to the fiscal committee for uh, um, you know, funds to, to make purchases. It's just so the committee knows, our office already has an exemption for election-related expenses uh, for, that, for that purpose. So the language in here is not necessary. It may actually interfere a little bit with uh, uh, the process that we currently have. So we would simply ask that those last two sentences be removed. Any questions of the Thank you, David. Thank you. I do have a question. Yes, David. Have you heard from any of the moderators? Uh, I heard from one yesterday. The moderators do run the elections. And they do, yeah. They are in charge. Yes. I saw that. Yep, yeah, they are. They play a major role. Thank you, David. Thank you. Could we uh, hear from the, the clerk association? You might want to represent them. Thank you for coming again so early. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to participate in this process. Um, and just for everyone's information, uh, late last evening, I did email uh, Senator Prescott um, the concerns that we were able to gather after pulling some of our uh, executive board. And to go through those, um, the, the first one is on page one. Do you have a handout? Yes. Yeah. Do I have a handout? I do not have a handout. Perhaps we could have somebody make a copy of I wasn't aware that I was going to be speaking this morning, I'm sorry. Yeah, very important because it's out there. Okay. Okay. Um, while she's making copies, I do have um, general comments that that we'd like to make, and if, if, if you're agreeable to that, it's not contained in, in the copy that, um, because this has been such a uh, short timetable, we haven't had an opportunity, obviously, to poll all of our membership. Um, but I think it's it's fair to say that right now we are um, we are very uncomfortable with the, the latest amendment that came out that um, pretty much looks like um, the Senate version would uh, be implemented for a year, which um, is a very positive mood in that it would provide at least a transition period to allow the election officials to be educated and to allow our voters to be educated that they do need to present a photo ID and we're not opposed in any way to a photo ID. So I'd like to go on record um, saying that. However, the, the Senate
second part of the bill, um, lines 8 through 26 or 16, uh, sections 8 through 16, which appear to be what was uh, passed by the House, there, there are a number of things in that bill that will cause um, a very significant impediment to the election process that occurs on election day. Um, and and I'm, I can go through when she brings the copy back um, some of the reasons that we believe um, that to be so. Um, we, no one's mentioned absentee ballots in any of the discussion that this, this has occurred. And, and frankly, that, that is an opportunity for voter fraud. And we believe that if we create an impediment to the voters and a discouragement to them and a frustration and, and hold up the line, that that is going to push more and more people into voting absentee ballots. And I don't think that's where the goal of, of anyone in this room. Um, domicile has been brought into this picture of photo ID. And again, we're definitely, we're not opposed to photo ID, but bringing in um, a whole separate issue of someone having to, at an election, prove their domicile if they have moved within a ward seems to be um, not the best workable approach. The DMV, they've already gone through and, and changed their domicile. They've brought their utility bills or their lease agreements or whatever, and they've proved their new residence before they're allowed to register the car. DMV records, their, the database and the voter database records do not communicate with, with each other. And there's no mechanism in place in this state for people who move from one place to another in their own town to send in a form to the supervisors of the checklist advising them that they have changed their address. So to, when, you, when you're having a major state election, to now require them to bring proof of their new domicile, especially when they're not aware that that's going to be happening, is, is going to be um, a significant uh, disenfranchise, I believe, to the voters, and the, it's going to require tremendous uh, clerical or effort on, on the part of the election officials to now look at all those documents and see if, in fact, they do prove in the domicile, and then to have them fill out a domicile affidavit if they don't have it, and then to change the records. And I think that that while they're, they mentioned that we did have a solution to get them out of the line, even still, I do think that with all of the photo ID requirements, that adding domicile change to the photo ID law may not be um, the best approach. Um, the, we, we looked at the, the second part of the bill brings in photo equipment, and there was a discussion here yesterday about Tennessee, where with, after their, I forget how many votes were cast in Tennessee. 625,000. There were 289, 285 voters who didn't present a photo ID. So we have 330 uh, wards in this state, and it, it seems that it, perhaps some consideration should be given to <coughs> the advisory committee that has been established, that they may be able to, before you automatically go through the expense, and the, again, it's an impediment to the election process. It's an extra step that's required of election officials and the voters that, that perhaps some evaluation in the future be um, assigned to that advisory committee to look at whether, in fact, photo equipment really is necessary. It's, it's possible that, that the education of our voters and our election officials might achieve a, a good photo ID system without have, having to have the photo equipment. Um, do, you, do you have the copies now? Yes. Okay, so page one, line 27. Um, our suggestion is, is to change that language to be consistent with page six, line 30, and that is to include driver's license of other states and federal government in both processes, the transition process and then the final uh, photo ID process. This is what um, uh, Dave Scanlon was alluding to. Our initial suggestion was to get those people, if, they, if their domiciles are different within their town, to get them out of the line so that they're not holding up the, you know, the hundreds <laughs> that are behind them to haul out their utility bills or whatever it is they need to prove their address, to get them out and to go to the supervisors of the checklist. This is for two reasons. Ballot clerks 
statutorily do not have any authority to determine whether a voter is, has a qualified domicile. Supervisors have a checklist, it rests with them. And, it, and then it's going to speed up the line. But again, our, our ultimate, after thinking about this overnight, is, is I think we would urge serious consideration be given to just removing the new domicile requirement out of the photo ID bill. Um, page six, line nine, we have a question. It says, if the voter does not desire to execute a qualified voter affidavit, what then? Are they, are they then therefore forfeiting their voter rights? So that's, that's just a question that I think we need to think about. Page nine, line 14. Um, this is changing it because as Dave alluded, the clerks are not the town clerks. City clerks are. City clerks serve as the, the, the chief election official. In towns, it's the moderator. The moderator is the chief election official. And um, this, this language um, would correct uh, erroneously placing the, the um, duty of the clerk to determine if someone is qualified to vote. It would just simply say the clerk um, affirms that the person appears on the checklist. That determination has already been made by the supervisor of the checklist. And we did note these are just, I believe, oversight technical issues, but nowhere in the legislation could we find where it stated that the ballot clerk Shall mark, shall mark the check that the voter presented a qualified voter affidavit in lieu of a photo ID. Yet um, the, the um, person, it says the person, and, and that's the supervisors of the checklist who enter the information into the statewide database. They must enter this into the information into the statewide voter database, and they utilize the marked checklist when they enter the election in the database. So I think there needs to be something in the legislation that would that says that the ballot clerks must mark the checklist if they're presented with a qualified voter affidavit. If in fact you want to keep track of that, and and um, it also says that at the end of the election the ballot clerks must count how many voters did not present a valid photo ID. Again, this goes back to the checklist. What are they going to count? Um, if, if, they, if there's a place to mark on the checklist that they were presented with a qualified voter affidavit, they would then be able to count that. Uh, page 10, line 2830, um, it, it's just a consistency it, um, to delete one of the lines, making the sig signature of one election official be sufficient. This is just an effort to make the election process be more efficient. Everyone is going to be very, very busy with lots of new duties, and it would be good if just what the moderator who's taking the photo, if that's really where we go, or he's overseeing the execution of a challenge voter affidavit that the moderator um, could sign. Um, and I, I wanted to just give you an example um, of, of a, one of the, in the first version, the Senate version, election officials are given the discretion if someone comes into their polling place without a photo ID, to um, if they're alone, you know, known to them, just to allow them to vote by saying, "Yes, I know that you're you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones." As an, we, for as an example, in our town, we have a gentleman um, who has a motorized wheelchair, and he comes to our town office um, almost weekly with his business, and and we help him. He's in addition to being in a wheelchair, he's a little bit mentally inca incapacitated. And we help him with his business. And I can clearly envision him, he, he drives his wheelchair to the, to the election, he does that, and he votes. He may very well come in without his photo ID. Everyone in town knows Mr. X. <laughs> um, and to me, it would be uh, really sad if election officials <coughs> aren't given the authority to allow Mr. Strano to, I said his name, <laughs> to cast his vote without having to go through the process of being taken out of the line, singled out in his mind, having his photo taken perhaps, and then having to execute a qualified voter affidavit, which he may not really even understand what he's voting. So I think it would be good to leave that in the House version as well, the second version, the, sec the second phase of this, um, and, and you still have the fallback. If people that are there viewing the election feel like there's funny business going on or there's fraud, they have a right to challenge that. 
Um, so I think there's a safety net there. Um, so I would urge your uh, consideration be given to that. Um, hopefully I've, I've covered all the, all the issues. And again, I, I really appreciate, we really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, I would like to say, because you, you brought it up, and it's a, I think it's a really valid concern. And I decided to, uh, to say it this morning. Basically, right now, these are really huge, huge changes, huge changes that are happening for our New Hampshire election process. There are three election officials in this room, three election officials who do not have authority to run the elections, who, you know, we were on the ground floor trying to make sure that everything goes smoothly, yes. But the moderators, the ballot clerks, the ballot clerks who are the fabric, I believe, of the election process in New Hampshire, they're people that come in once or twice a year to perform a community service. They're not highly trained election officials, and this would be putting huge amounts of responsibility on them, discouraging them from continuing to participate, and also putting clerks in a position where we have to choose people who may be more qualified to carry out a higher level of responsibilities. But these people, ballot clerks, supervisors of the checklist, moderators, have not had an opportunity to, to see this and, and to weigh in on what the impact is from their point of view. So uh, wh while we're here and we very much appreciate it, I, I think that is important to acknowledge that. Any questions? Thank you for bringing your concerns. If there's any other concerns, we would like to hear them if they, if they come up as you speak with your association. Um, Said it many times. If we, if we stick this, stick to this bill being a voter identification bill rather than a you know, verification of person domicile, we're sticking to what the bill's title is. Um, is there a uh, after the testimony of the clerks? Is there a uh, movement in the heart of the house? Is it these kind of reason that we would work on the, the parts to make sure that there is. That is removed from this bill and give discretion to another legislature to pick that up as a domicile well, bill. I think that the suggestion that they made of simply referring a person who has changed their address within the same ward, just re referring them to the registration desk and uh, let the supervisors of the checklist update their information. I mean, that is the supervisor's job. It won't cause any great impediment to the process. And, and, and we're just asking, you know, the whole effort here is to treat everyone the same. And everyone else who has changed their address typically goes to the town clerk and, and presents evidence of their new domicile. And that's updated on the checklist by the supervisors. And we're just asking anyone who has failed to do that to do the same thing on election day if they you know, haven't done it by them. Um, it's not a great burden for them to walk over to the other table and, and show their uh, new domicile. So that, that already exists. Exactly. So why are we dealing with it in a photo identification bill that already exists? That well, you we just recommended it. I think that the recommendation is a good one. Uh, could we have a clarification? Um. Yes, uh, we, we, we recommended that the domicile requirement be removed from the bill because there is already in place um, when they confirm their address with the ballot clerk, if their address within the ward has changed, the, the law states now that the ballot clerk simply draw a red line 
through their address, write the new address on it. Then the supervisors of the checklist following the election, when they're entering the results of the marked checklist, they correct their address at that point. So it's a very smooth process. There is currently absolutely no ability for a voter to change their address. They've done it with the town clerk for DMV purposes or dog license purposes. Those don't connect to the supervisors of the checklist and the voter checklist. They may have changed their address six or eight months ago within the town, but there's, that does not get to the voter checklist. And the way that the legislation is written currently works because if they come, when they check in, if their address within their ward is different, the ballot clerk simply draw a red line through it, write their new address on it. At the end of the election, the supervisors record that in the voter database. That's how it gets updated now. They're not having to prove anything, get out of line, stand in another line where other people are already standing to do multiple tasks and prove their domicile and then get back in line and vote. So I, I'm I sorry if I didn't make that clear. No, I, I understand the process perfectly. If somebody came in prior to the election day and wanted to update their address so that they moved, would you just cross it out and write them a new address? No. If they came in and filled out a new voter registration card and asked for that to go to the supervisors of the checklist, yes, that does not happen. People do not ever come in to the town office and request that their voter registration be changed to reflect their new address. They believe that when they do it for DMV purposes, which we, we have no right under the law to change a voter record. DMV is privacy information, and we, we cannot compare DMV records to We're voter not talking records. about comparing DMV. But I'm saying that they, don't, person updating they don't their do it. registration they don't when they move. They don't update their registration when they move. So if somebody moves within the same district, right. do you think they should never have to show evidence of their domicile? I, I think that the law as it stands right now works. I mean, they, if they move within the same district, and they t they when they reach the ballot clerks and, and tell them that their address is no longer 5 Maple Street, it's 12 Elm Street. And many times it's because they've been foreclosed on and they moved into an apartment six months ago. And then they proved it for other purposes. They believe that that's already happened. I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm just asking, is the clerk's position that when somebody changes their address, that they should not have to show any evidence of that in order to this, um, update the Probably not a real appropriate question to ask. Just, she's giving information concerning you know, how it's done now. We do verify address. We do not verify the address. That's what she just said. I think, I think we all understand the current process mm -hmm. is that if somebody comes in, you receive a ballot, and their address is not what is marked on the checklist, mm -hmm. the ballot clerk, who is, we've already heard, has no authority to make decisions and update records, they currently just draw a line through it and change the address. And nobody presents any evidence of a new domicile. And I'm just wondering if the clerks think that that's a good well, process. Ask me what they think. If you just ask a specific question, you raise your hand, you want well, to answer. I have a solution, a suggested solution, yeah. that, I'm separate from this, that when someone does change their address from the, within the town for other purposes, that there, there could be a statute that allows that address or them to, at that point in time to require them to also fill out a change if they're on the voter checklist. So that it's, happen, it's happening 365 days a year, and then when the supervisors meet throughout the year, they can update their record. That would, I think, um, achieve what you're trying to achieve, but it would, it, and at the same time, it wouldn't try to put this process that's happened for 365 days into a state general election um, when we're trying to you know, move people through officially. Yes, yes, yes. As far as that goes, as far as the registration on election day, the thing of it is they're moving within the city, in a city ward or within the town. The supervisors of the checklist duty usually on election day are registering new voters in that city or that town. So basically where they've already been qualified as a voter in that city or town, the ballot clerks on election day have been given the authority to cross out the name and write the new address, and it's up to the supervisors at that point in time, once the election is done, to go ahead to either go ahead and just update it. But if they have questions, then they can send out a 30-day letter to that individual. 
in lieu of having them go out of line, join the people now that are registering as first time voters in that ward or in that town in lieu of in waiting in that line and going back in that line to vote. That's a really good point. There is a there is a 30 day letter process that the supervisors could send out and if it doesn't come back or if it comes back as undeliverable, then that gives them reason to um, you know that causes that right. questions the address. Eight. But that happens following an election. Senator Barnes has a question. Yeah. You mentioned earlier this gentleman from Newmarket, who everybody knows. Yeah. What we have here, how would he handle if he doesn't have his registration? His, his photo ID? Photo ID. He, well, during the first year, we, we'd allow him to vote. Okay. In the second year, he would have to be um, taken out of line and go have a photo taken. The first year is more of a <coughs> process yep. for the voters. Right. What happens in the case of that gentleman in the wheelchair, very busy election, and I'm new in town, and I'm standing there, mm -hmm. and you guys let this follow through, because you know him. Mm -hmm. You don't know me because I just got here, mm -hmm. and I don't, and I can't have the same privilege as this guy being here. Right. What happens there? They, we, we say, I'm very sorry, but we don't know who you are, and, and the qualified voter affidavit process is what you've got to go through. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. I won't see my mind behind it. Do you have an idea of how many people you're referring to in a, in a general election? Who changed their address in town? Are we talking tens, hundreds? What, what, what um, kinds of, of numbers of people? Do we have um, about 5,000 people on our checklist, and I would guesstimate that there may be um, 20 that have changed addresses. That might be on the high side, but I'll estimate it on the high side for the sake of argument. <coughs> That was my question. Are we prepared to discuss yes. um, domicile in a different bill, not a photo ID bill? Well, I, I, I still think that what they <coughs> propose here in writing to uh, direct the voter to proceed to the supervisor of the checklist would be a satisfactory solution to it. We're not talking about hundreds of people. We've been heard on the high side, 20 people were up today on one, you know, one. And how many clerks have, have you spoken to and say we got the address responsibility to you? And you, you didn't draft the bill, right? You didn't work with people to, to draft the bill. And now, when the bill is, is you know, in a committee conference on the last day, you're suggesting that we don't look at the title of photo identification. We talk about domicile. This is a, a sticking point. You did not have a public hearing in uh, January of this year concerning domicile. You had a public hearing when it came to the House in March about photo identification. It's really off track, and it's, it's misplaced good intentions. And it's, it, it will cause disenfranchisement of 20 people in every town of this state. And that's just for 5,000 you know, people on the I don't think it's appropriate. Well, let, let me just respond to what you said. Sure. Okay, first of all, we had multiple guests on my file. We had, we had multiple hearings on this bill, including the amendment that had the language in that we're discussing right now. These issues were raised. The amendment to the House 
of public hearings on it, voted and passed and sent to the Senate um, three weeks ago. It's been out there. And when we sat with you and these three ladies representing the Clerks Association yesterday afternoon, this was in the document that everybody was aware of that we thought we'd come to an understanding of how we were going to uh, agree. Um, and, and I think we, we have a, and that was concerning the, the narrowing of the ballot ID. Right. That was the meeting this morning, of yesterday morning. That was right. the meeting. And that the House version of the bill would be implemented after a year. So, uh, again, you know, this, this doesn't have to be an issue that um, the entire bill unravels over. Mm -hmm. I think what they proposed would be a, a satisfactory solution. Um, if you're prepared to walk away mm -hmm. over that, uh, it's, it's not worth letting this whole thing fall apart. Um, it's a very simple. Well, let me just explain to you. We have <coughs> student IDs taken off the list which is where the house wants to be. And I agree with you. We should not let it unravel over this. And you need to yield. And you've gotten the if photo it, identity. You've gotten, you've gotten your, your if uh, this, You don't have to continue. Yeah. This is the only point that you yeah. feel that we need to yield over this line. Yeah. I'm because gonna we're, we're, we're in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. 10 minute recess. So but I think we should take a 10 minute yeah. before recess. You, before you recess, yeah. we agree with everything the Secretary of State said. Yeah. We agree with. Um, the, uh, I, I think the entire amendment that you presented to us yesterday, we're, we're, we're fine with that. We're prepared to sign that. And with the changes the Secretary of State has um, suggested, if uh, the only other thing we need to do is eliminate the language about the update, I think it's a mistake. I think it's unnecessary. But um, I think this legislation can move ahead without it. scenario nor any other conceivable scenario will anybody be disenfranchised with this legislation in place. So it, it, at most somebody's experienced some minor inconvenience, but they're not disenfranchised. So with that, I'm not sure if there's a need to reset. No, there isn't. So if we can um, so that agree, was we can agree that the amendment that you drafted yesterday with the corrections the Secretary of State has offered and removing of that process to update a person's domicile, I think will be in agreement. And then we have, uh, as the uh, page one, line 27, include the driver's license of the <coughs> states and federal government. That's fine. And then uh, page five, line 22 to 29, What are you, uh, you referring to now? Uh, this is the section the clerk, uh, the clerk, the paper the clerk the paper. Mm -hmm. And therefore, pretty much we've decided that we're, we're going to, rather than adopt language, we're going to remove. You're going to leave the current procedure in place with it and yeah. cross it off and update okay. it. And on page six, line nine, the conversation was. Um, change the language to ensure that the statutory determination of who can be added to a voter checklist remains with the supervisors of the checklist and not the town clerk. 
And that is the language that uh, Which page is this? Page 9, line 14. Oh, I'm sorry, page 6, line 9. Sorry, yeah, I, I skipped one. Line if, the, if, the, if the voter does not desire <coughs> to execute a qualified voter affidavit, are they then therefore forfeiting their voting rights? There's, a, there's just a nuance of how the wording is between the Senate version and the House version. The Senate version is a requirement that they fill out, I'm and then not, yours is a desire. You have to find it, but I'm not finding what you're All right, uh, you're page desired. six, line nine. Yes. There's a word in there called desires. Right. That the voter desires. I think in the in the Senate version, it's it's a little bit more straightforward <coughs> rather than the word desires. What is the uh, Let me see how <coughs> the Senate version made. Would you, would you, would you like to just say if the voter executes a Qualified neighbor, voter affidavit. Um, I, I would just try and look at where that same language is yeah. in the in the in the first year and see if that is. Now, page 9, line 14. Uh, change the language to state so that in, in italics, if you, as you're reading what uh, the clerks have brought forward, in italics it says to ensure that the statutory determination <coughs> of the added to a voter checklist remains with the supervisor. Try again. What of the checklist. Page 9. Page line 14. It says, I the clerk of. Yeah, so we have to find out what is the, the, the clerk's new language would be to be certain that it is people that are added to the checklist uh, are is under the supervision of the, or that responsibility remains with the supervisors of the checklist. Do you have a recommendation of how to change this of, on line 14 through 16? Oh, this is yeah, broader I, than this. Mm -hmm. They're saying on line 15, mm -hmm. um, we, uh, in this document, the amendment, this voucher is qualified, uh, this voucher is qualified to vote in the, in the city or town. This, and here they're saying on this voucher is listed on the voter checklist for. Mm -hmm. that, that seems to be their, their uh, suggested change. I, I would say that's an acceptable change. It's, it's not asking more generic set of questions. Yes, I'm here with their hand up. Listed on the voter checklist. Yes. Didn't uh, I understood it? Uh, the clerk is in the city, and the moderator is in the town. And I think this was one of the questions that they brought up, and they and uh, they want to check that up. <coughs> There's a difference between how the town and the city is operating. I don't know if that's the case. Would, would use that language that is, is written here. Do we agree? Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it scratch the words qualified. To vote in this city. Well, I would think. And, and put in listed on the voucher. On the voucher. Voter the voter checklist. Checklist. I Four. think it's the same to leave the words the city or town because I think that's the intent. You know, there's one more, one less thing for the clerk to write. Yeah, more in this. Yeah. So <coughs> other than, than is qualified to vote. Uh, I think the suggestion is is to replace that on the with, voter checklist. Uh, is listed on the voter checklist in the city. Yeah. 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 All right. And then we got to figure we out. Agree? I mean, uh, we, we agree. I, 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 I want to make sure the team agrees. Yeah. All right. Um, now to keep track 
uh, the next paragraph there. <coughs> No way to restate that the ballot clerk uh, marked the checklist as a voucher, then the voter presented a qualified voter affidavit <coughs> to a voter ID. So, if you wanted to make that differentiation. Actually, I don't think that's true. Okay, <coughs> good, let's find it. I, well, I think on both versions, House and Senate, it, it's pretty clear that, in fact, it even introduces a new language about drawing a line through the name of a person when they announce their. Um, their name, if, uh, I'm not sure if maybe the, the sequence is a little bit out of order, but obviously the person's name is being checked off and they're only going to proceed to vote if they do show that proof. And if they, if they don't show evidence, you know, acceptable evidence of a photo ID or you know, whatever, yeah. um, then they're going to sign an affidavit. So you, you, you that already, the affidavit's going to be the record. Exactly. You can differentiate the way to yeah. So you, you, you know, differentiate the, the voters who, I mean, they're all going to be marked off, and the ones oh. who haven't have signed the affidavit, so it's a decision automatically. Okay. All right. All right. Do you have a question here? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Dave Scanlon, um, thanks for being here. Um, <laughs> sorry. If we're going to keep track, and there's going to be a record of how many people do sign a challenge voter affidavit or a qualified voter affidavit, is there a need to have a procedure at the checklist for that? <clears throat> and that's what was discussed here, that, that the clerks had a concern, is the, the, about the third of the last paragraph on this page. I think the answer is yes, and it's something that we're going to have to develop. Um, it may also require some I'll say field additions to our database so that, that information can be uh, entered. Um, but it's a process we're going to have to develop. So it's not required for us to put the detail in this bill? Um, I think it, it, it probably ought to have some language in there that would give us the flexibility to deal with it. And then once, you know, once we come up with that process, we can, we can put it in statute and people should. I just want to point out that on page 6, line 18, it says, uh, line 21, the person answering voter information centralized voter registration database shall cause records to indicate when a voter has not presented a valid photo identification and has executed a qualified voter affidavit. So obviously, you know, the hub office is going to have to add that field, and the supervisors, are, when they update the information, <coughs> Just as you, you have that now for somebody that doesn't end, uh, show a photo ID, they're already flagged now. We're just you know, going to be uh, flagging these individuals. It'll involve updating the, the database um, what is there? with additional fields, and that was part of the reason that we originally agreed to defer things to give them the time at the HAVA office to do that. So I, I think it's the legislation covers it. They may have to, you know, work behind the scenes to work out the process, but it, was that a question? Having looked at that, do you think that there's need to make further change in the language? No, I mean, I think we'll have to develop a process, but I think we, we can do it. And is this enough of a uh, opening for you to take that and say, yes, that's what the Senate wanted to have it? Because we'll, we'll be happy to make the adjustment words if that were necessary. Right. in this bill to accomplish. I, I need a few minutes to think about that. All right. <laughs> well, I, we're all in agreement that if he comes to us and says we need to add something, I think we're all going to work. Okay, good. So we want to keep track. Okay. All right. The next one, the next paragraph is, is that um, it's, if, he, if we do keep track, then we will be able to keep count. That's what the next paragraph is. It says, let's keep count. So it satisfies the next paragraph. Right. If we do keep track, I, I think our, the, the house position is we're happy to satisfy the, the requirements. We think it's already in there. We mean it's maybe we need to do that. Dave Scanlon, the clerk, may not believe that this is right, and we're working on this collaboratively. Good idea. Page 10, line 28. Let me state the reason we had two was that we thought this was an extraordinarily unusual case. Uh, that uh, this is a very few religions have this. I'm aware of some in the, in, uh, in the Middle East.
Greece, and I'm aware of some in uh, uh, Polynesia, and in some parts of, uh, uh, and more, probably most appropriately in the United States, as some Indians uh, group. Uh, however, I wouldn't think it would be very frequent, and it might be a mechanism that someone trying to avoid. And we said that, if this were an important issue or not, well, that was the reason we had the two signatures, because we thought it would almost never happen, and, and therefore it needed a special scrutiny. But uh, recommendation of your town moderator, wasn't it? It was it might, yeah, my, my town moderator specifically pointed out that, but I, I'm not wedded to it. Uh, right. Does that mean that was based on it? I get you. Are we going to eliminate all of lines 28 through 31, or just eliminate the, the second signature? Put, put page. Oh, oh, I think it was just the second okay. signature. Okay. All right. So page 10. Yes. Just like. Name of, we'll just change it, name of election official officer, or do we change it to um, moderator, moderator supervisor. or supervisor of the check? Election officer, I believe, includes okay. the election people okay. might, we might want to have signed. So if we just change uh, on line 29, cross out first, yep. and then cross out the whole line, name of second. Right. Uh, and then on line 30, it looks like 31, signature of election officer, Right. The Eliminate signature of second election. Second, 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 second. You got it. Okay. All right. We will take a uh, take a, a little recess. Did you yeah. want to discuss the education thing? Putting them into one. Yes. Um, if you could present that for me, Tom. Basically, in Senator Prescott's amendment that I think he sent out uh, night before last basically had the House and the Senate versions, education portions in one three paragraph section. We could do that and put it in the first part of the bill that becomes effective on passage, then there doesn't need to be a second education component that goes into effect when the House. Yeah, we'd rather have the same education component be done once. Can you want us to just look at this while we're in the office of recess and, and yeah. uh, if you're planning to take one minute, is that what you um, I would say we would reconvene at 9.30. Yeah. Maybe Dave has an answer then, but I don't know if that's important, because we're just going to, the committee agrees that we'll put that into the bill. When we do the I think we would need no more than 10 minutes. We have other things to do, obviously. Well, uh, yeah, because, uh, Senator Barnes, you wanted a little bit more time to, to, to converse with different people? Certainly, Mr. Chen. How do you say? Who am I I think I understand. At 9.30? Before you go, yeah. if you, uh, you've asked from opinions of everyone except us, and there's uh, a couple of changes that I think, in the interest of what you mentioned yesterday, consolidating and making a cleaner bill, uh, don't get offended, David. Sorry. Oh, that's that's David doesn't. You you <laughs> you couldn't possibly offend. It's 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 um, section ten is redundant of section three. It could very easily be moved. Secretary <coughs> State's already talked about adjusting um, the. I'm sorry. No, section ten. Page eight. Line 14 through 24. I think we can move that over to where section three is and just eliminate this. Representative Bates, I think the only issue was RSA 659.13.5. I don't know if it exists until your portion goes in. At least that was according oh, to the lights. That's at least according to the drafter. The reason okay. we needed it twice. And, and um, what about section 11? That's redundant for section four. I don't think there's any reason why that can't yeah, be put in the Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did. Did you get that? Sorry. Uh, yeah, on page 8, yeah. uh, uh, line 25, the advantage of moving these, you know, combining these sections so that can be made clearer, uh, it also provides a definition of a voucher as specified by the Senate version. So it may be in your interest to do that, but unless you would want uh, the voucher to be defined.
find by some other process. There's no reason for that to change. And, 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 and it would seem to be a training problem if it were different. So you might want to wish to consider that in the next Well, I think it's important that we, we think it's a good good that now. So we can explain it one more time, and I think well, that Jack Barnes can pick up on that really quick. Section 11 <laughs> is section, and section 4 both deal with the identification card voucher. Okay, yeah. And in the House version, we actually put in a form to use for that purpose, and um, it just makes sense that we would, rather than change that section a year later, just incorporate this in the very beginning. Right. That's one less thing that has to change. Good. Then yes, we will. We'll get into that probably on that one. Mm -hmm. well, no, we're, 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 we're offering it as, as, as a suggestion. Yeah. 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 You, you don't need to come to add a, a concession. That's Line one, 
you want to insert the ballot clerk shall mark the checklist in accordance with the uniform procedures developed by the Secretary of State. After such entries. Okay. We're all set. Everybody agrees with those two? Yes. Okay. Well, I, um, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say in conclusion. The finality of our uh, agreement on this was it a, an experience that you'd like to describe? Satisfaction and hard work. I appreciate some input. Well, it was a certainly experience. <laughs> Lots of hard work and many, uh, on some occasions it seemed like we were at insurmountable impasses, but we've, uh, we've done a good job bringing it all together, um, finding the common ground where we could agree and uh, pass a legislation that will achieve the objectives that I think we all have without undue problems created during the transition process. And um, I believe we were able to do that to the satisfaction of all those that you wanted to have as part of the process, uh, Secretary of State, the Dean Town Clerks. Um, Attorney General has been an integral part of the process that they you know, certainly have safeguards as possible so there's not uh, calamity at the polls this fall and yet the people will uh, have what they desire which is I present my ID for a lot of things and I wouldn't mind presenting it to the vote and uh, we look forward to that. Senator Bard? <coughs>